This is Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster, and you all should be listening to Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Hey, this is Jimmy Street, host of the Live and in Color with Wolfie D podcast. Hear the life and times of professional wrestler Wolfie D. From his time in the territories with PG-13, to his time in WWE, ECW, WCW, TNA, and more. Nothing is off limits, and nothing will be held back. Thanks again for tuning in. Here he is, Wolfie D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome one more time to the Live and in Color with Wolfie D podcast. And today we welcome an absolute legend in this business. He is the taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fine, guys. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, we totally appreciate you coming on, Kevin. Man, so when he told me we were having you on... I started thinking back. I'm like, well, I've, I've worked in, the, you know, I worked Steiner and Rotundo with you in the corner at WCW, small run there, but I've never really been around you that much. So I was, most of the people that come on, I've been around them and known them for years, but you and I never really crossed paths like that. And so I had to start doing my research and cause you know, like I said, I don't know you personally. So the one thing that just blew my mind when I was researching you is that you were never formally trained as a professional wrestler. No. I'm like somebody that's that successful and everything that was never trained. How did that go down? I mean, did they smarten you up before the match or did they give you, what'd you think well, when they gave you a finish? Th- this is a great story. I was an amateur wrestler and I used to wrestle at the Boston YMC Union, not A, Boston mm-hmm. YMC Union. And uh, the pro wrestlers would come in and they were training with weights and this guy came in one day and he said, Hey, you want to work out? I was working out with a guy. I said, yeah. And we became friends. He had graduated from Harvard law mm-hmm. school in Oxford. Wow. But he, he was from South Africa and he was part of the, the Berry family who were owned the diamond mines. Okay. All he wanted to do was be a wrestler. But at that time it was way beneath their aristocratic family. Yeah. Right. But he would wrestle these small, I would say they were independents back before people knew about independence. Right. But in Montreal, when they had two territories, the Rougeaux and the Vachons, mm-hmm. there was a building in Montreal called Verdun. And uh, it was like the guy that ran it, his name was Pat Gerard. He wrestled as Pat Curry. He mm-hmm. was the biggest name in Europe in the 40s. Wow. And both companies let their guys come and wrestle there because he had trained the Garvins, Pat Patterson, Fernand Fouchette, okay. uh, Ricky Martel's brother, a host and a host of others. Wow. So my friend said to me one day, would you like to try Professor Russing? He said, I'm booked in Montreal. I said, yeah, yeah, sure. I'd like to try it. Yeah. So I've been a wrestling fan my whole life and I still am. And, uh, I go up and there was no guys going into the ring before the show. You know what I mean? Right. So I go in the dressing room and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting because I've been an amateur wrestler for 10 years. Uh-huh. fairly accomplished and I, I knew you couldn't take a guy and throw him by his hair across the ring or pull him down by his tights <laughs> right <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting for them to tell me what to do uh-huh. so about uh, 45 minutes before the show I said to the referee hey uh, are you going to tell me what's going on he said I'll be back yeah, so okay. this went on for the 45 minutes <laughs> they never smart me up and sent me to the ring and they sent really? me to the ring with a big star his name was Fernand de Frechette and he wrestled that there under a mask Okay. so I'm wrestling him and I, I go behind him you know I don't know what to do so I go behind him and, and take him down and drop him and I said well I must should kick him now <laughs> I kick him right in the face. He <laughs> swearing the French, Tabernak, you know, all this. He rolls out of the ring and he's on the apron and he's holding on to the top rope. And I, you know, I knew enough about pro wrestling about the slingshot, but I didn't know how to do it. 
Right. So I I hit the ropes as hard as I could on the other side and came off at about 30 miles an hour. And I knocked him back into the third row. He got up, pulled his mask on, and he's swearing in French and in English. He goes back to the dressing room. Well, I jump off on the, on the top rope and I'm yelling, come back, come back, come back. <laughs> what the hell is going on? So, Why I, would he I, take I, his mask off? Because he was through. He said, that's it, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so I'm I'm walking back to the dressing room. I said, "Boy, I'm gonna get an ass whipping here." So I get there, and he says, "What the fuck were you doing?" I said, "This is my first match, and they didn't tell me anything." He said, "They didn't give you a finish." I said, "No." His anger turned then to the referee, and he snatched the referee and said, "Hey, he could have killed me, or I could have killed him. What are you guys doing?" Yeah. So. Uh, he calmed down and he said, next week, get here a couple of hours early and I'll take you through a match. And he took me through a match and then that was, lo and behold, how it happened. Wow. And so after, after that, did you start like training regularly, you know, to wrestle or? Well, I, uh, yeah, I would go to, uh, I was lucky enough to wrestle in Montreal on Friday and then Saturday, I would go to Brooklyn, 234 Broadway, upstairs, and in the gym was Pedro Morales, huh. uh, Ramon Perez, Victor Rivera, Isaac Rosario, uh, and a host of others, Johnny Rods, and a okay. host of others. And they took me, I was the only angle in the gym, and they took me under their wing and taught me what to do without them I never would have been if Fernando yeah. Shek turned on me I never would have gone past the first match so that I was is very lucky. an amazing story it really is <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine going out not knowing the finish or nothing. I could, but you were an amateur wrestler so you knew you could take care of yourself if you had to you just weren't really sure what to do <laughs> well, I, 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 I knew uh, that I could take him down, but I didn't know. If, I thought, well, he's going to kill me. When I left the ring, I said, oh, God, this is going to be a short career. And it turned out to be quite a long one. Yes. So those guys were really, really super nice to me. Yeah. That's impressive. That's awesome. Hey, folks, to get your official Live It In Color with Wolfie D merchandise, go to ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Live Wolfie D. Check it out. If you're listening to Live It In Color with Wolfie D on Apple Podcast and like what you're hearing, go ahead and leave a five-star rating. And while you're at it, write a review. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you'd like to hear in the future. It's very important to us and always appreciated. Thanks again. Hey, so another thing I noticed, and I don't remember, I may not have been a fan at that time, but like I made my name in Memphis. So I know a lot of guys come through Memphis and they hated it and have bad stories of it. It was good to me. I cannot complain about Memphis at all or Jerry Jarrett or Jerry Lawler. I can't. Uh, they were good to me. And uh, so I noticed that you had a really short, you were there for a short amount of time. What kind of memories you got of Memphis? I, I really enjoyed Memphis. I went there. I was, uh, Jerry Jarrett came to me. Business was down. And he actually came and recruited me and Steve Kern from Atlanta. Mm. They made a trade and sent me and Steve up there. And when I started, the business was down and Jerry came to me and said, what would you do to turn this thing around? I said, I'd beat all the baby faces. You've got the baby faces, Lawler and Dundee and the tag team champions of baby faces. You got to have some heat here. Right. So they drew about 12,000. They put me with Jimmy Hart, and Jarrett decided he listened and he beat all the baby faces that night. And right. 
couple of baby faces came in and looked at me and said, you just killed the territory. I said, okay. <laughs> Next week, we had a match, Lawler against Jimmy Hart, with me and Wayne Ferris, who became the Honky Talk fan, yeah. as special referees, and Jimmy beat Lawler. We drew uh -huh. $37,000, and they were off and running. And what year was that? That was 81. 81. See, I don't even think I started watching wrestling until about 82. I was young. Yeah. So we were off and running, and then there was some, of course, you know, the new guy that comes in and the owner listened to him. There was mm -hmm. a lot of heat there, and I said, this isn't going to work for me. So I had a job waiting for me in Knoxville, uh, and I was living in Knoxville at the time. Yeah, I, I I said uh, Black Shack was going to give me the book, and I said, "Well, better get out of here." And, <laughs> but I had great memories of Memphis. Yeah, they had a unique brand of wrestling that yeah. worked there. The thing about Memphis, both of you and you recall this: no other TV came in there. No, so right. they and had it was the it was the final yeah. territory to to go down. Right, and they had no nothing to compare it with until cable TV yeah. decided to come in. And uh, I thought Jerry Jarrett was one of the smartest guys I ever met. He is. Like you said, he lasted to the end. Yep. And all the stars that he made there, people still talk about them, whether yeah. it's going way back in time. He didn't make Sputnik, but... People still talk about Spot oh, yeah. Memphis, yeah. Lala, Dundee, uh, Wayne, Jimmy Hart. I mean, he when he made stars, he made stars forever. Yeah. So he was very, very smart. Yes, he was. He's the one that came up with the idea. Like I came up with our gimmick, but then when we went to him to get a job, he was like, okay, we're going to make rap videos. Y'all are going to do this. Y'all ain't coming in for a month. We're just going to play these rap videos, and it worked. <laughs> I, he was one of the first guys I remember that did wrestling videos that really weren't wrestling videos. Right. They were more MTV videos. You remember when the... Uh, do you remember when the... Uh, Fabulous ones. Went oh there. yeah! I mean, it looked like an MTV video, you know. Yeah, yeah. Handsome man. I mean, and they when they first appeared, they was blew the building over. Yeah, it, it he was just the, knew the, how the to get people over. Right? Yeah. You remember the Kamala video where they had him out in the woods? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That was so good. So good. Yeah. So as a kid, I was a Jim Crockett Promotions, you know, East Coast, Mid-Atlantic kid. I grew up in Virginia. One of the first gimmicks I ever remember seeing of you, and I know you've you've probably answered this question a million times, but is that Prince of Darkness gimmick. What was the influence on that? Was that like a Charles Manson, Anton LaVey kind of thing? Or, or is that just you and you said, this is the most evil thing I can do as far as heat? I know you're the king of heat. Well, the thing was, I spent a lot of time in Asia with Mark Lewin, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong. And you got to realize this is way before the Internet. Right. And and people at that time didn't know where those countries even were. Yeah. But they knew they were evil or they thought it was evil. So when I came into Florida, I was a baby face and... I had split the dress room. Steve Curdy actually sent the interview from Memphis and said, Mike Graham, he ain't the same guy that we once knew. Barry Windham mentioned that, hey, he's not the same guy. Blackjack, and I split the dress room. Mike was for me. Other people were for me. And what happened was I knew I couldn't start P, that I had to start at A. So they put me and Barry in a... Uh, a 60 minute match on television for the belt. It was held up. And Barry, I went to dive at Barry. He moved out of the way. I fell out of the ring. He held up the ropes. He let me climb back in. 15 minutes later, same thing, but reverse. Barry takes the bump. I pull the ropes up. He steps in. I kick him in the face and I dropped an elbow on him, pinned him one, two, three. Yeah. 
Yes, I grabbed the belt and Mike Rams came around and I'll never forget this. He mm-hmm. said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, this is what you want, so I'm going to give it to you. And I hit him with the belt. I hit him so hard. This is when we, we some of the jeans had buttons. It blew the buttons off his crotch. He wow. faced me holding his pants up. So then, <laughs> then you got to realize this is the 80s. I'm in yep. Florida. So I started doing the interviews where each week I put a little dark makeup on underneath my eye. look like I've been up all night. Yeah. So the subliminal message was, I'd be talking to an interview, and then I'd say, I see that Ford Fairlane following me all the time. You're not going to catch me. Yeah. And then I'd one step further, one step further, one step further, and I evolved that character. And I think what happens in today's wrestling, and I'm a big fan, and it's in great hands with some of these young, talented guys. Mm-hmm. But this long-term storytelling is right. lacking, and I understand yeah. why, because they're under pressure. Yeah, these ratings every week. Yeah, but if you back up and say, "Okay, we're going to take a guy, and we're really going to tell a story, and let him evolve into this character," mm-hmm. because I always compare myself. My wife's not a big wrestle fan. Mm-hmm. And she saw a tape of me and Andre, uh-huh. and she said, he couldn't have been seven four. I said, why? <laughs> she said, when he hit you, punched you in the face, all you did was turn your head. I said, honey, I saw the alien. Do you guys ever remember the alien, the first one? Oh, yeah. yeah. The most scary thing in that movie to me was when the alien popped out of the guy's chest, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How big was that alien? He was a foot tall. Yeah. You could have hit him with fly <laughs> water and killed him. Right. But at the end of the movie, he was as big as the ship. So was he really as big as the ship, or was that perceived in the head? So yeah. I knew my stature. I was 5'8". The only good thing was I had power lifted and bodybuilded, so I was had some size on me physically, but I was only 5'8". But yeah. I worked with Dusty. I worked with... Superstar, Andre, you know, all the big guys. And they were the ones that got me over because they oversold for me. So the people thought, well, this guy gets some kind of power. Yeah. And it just kind of worked out. And the other thing is, different time, different era, willing suspension of disbelief. A lot of people still believed. But when I was with Mark, we kept our characters all the time. We rode to the towns with our robes on. We went to live the, the gimmick. The yeah, we lived the gimmick so people couldn't say, oh, that's just an act, those guys, and especially Mark, who, yeah. who really was in character. They would say, these guys were really nuts. So I think yeah. that was what helped. And, and again, small territory, territorial days. Sure. You couldn't be flying around the world with a robe on today, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Housen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't uh, think, I've said this a hundred times, because of how everything has changed and stuff, it's hard for the guys to get legitimate heat anymore because, you know, we've told them, you know, uh, it, it used to be, well, I'm really not sure if this guy's crazy or not, but now they know so much is on the internet and things like that. It's hard for me to make you mad at me if you know I'm trying to make you mad, that's my job, right. you know? Right, right. And the other thing is it, uh, that because of the internet, and this is no knock because it's a different era. Yeah. They're talking to one another. Oh, oh yeah. I can't, I can't wait to work with this one. Oh, they're so <laughs> smooth. I yeah. never get hurt. I mean, so I think the interest of rushing now is behind the scenes rather than the ring work. Yeah. And the one guy that stands out to me that keeps his heat is that MJF. I mean, oh, yeah. he looks like everybody wants to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know? Yeah. And uh, I, I, I said I, I watched uh, the replay of him and Punk 
And whoever came up with that finish, and Wolfie, I know, and Jimmy, you probably agree with me too. That was the guy that came up with that finish needs a gold medal because when he beat him with the tape, and then they pulled his arm up and the tape fell out. Yeah, I was certain Punk was going over. He wasn't going to lose twice in one match. Right. Uh, so they dumped a lot of heat on that kid. I don't know how he learned to talk the way he does, but he can talk them into the building. Yeah. This is one of those things they all need to sit down and say, okay, what are we going to do for the next six months to enhance him? Because yeah. he has, he has uh, some quality to get heat. In. Wolfie, you know, this business, to get to be a knight in shining armor, you have to kill a fire-breathing dragon. Not exactly. A exactly. Yeah. 100%. Let me ask you, you know, we were kind of talking about the, you know, how it's changed and all that. And another another thing, too, like I was saying about, you know, I can't, it's hard for me to make you mad if you know I'm trying to make you mad. Remember back in the day when you could, if a mark was up on the, uh, you know, the railing or whatever, giving you shit, if you drew back at them, they would sell because they weren't sure whether you're going to hit them or not. You can't do right. that. No. They'll just stand there because <laughs> they're yeah. not afraid. They're not afraid, and they know if you hit them, there's a lawsuit. Right. Yeah. yeah. Back then, there was you know very little lawsuits that I recall. Yeah. But uh, and even uh, like when the the guy speared Seth Rollins or whatever, you know. Back in the day, that dude would have got his brains kicked in. And I felt like they, you know, they kind of took it easy on him. They just took him out, man. I mean, I've had it happen to me. And, you know, you know the deal. They get in that ring, they're done. Well, in Florida, Eddie Graham had a rule. He didn't care if you got in a fight outside the ring. He'd take care of the lawsuit. Right. But if you lost, you packed your bag that night. And you I've always heard that kind of stuff from way back then. Yeah. You know? And, uh, this is probably the worst thing I ever did as I've gotten older. I've regretted it, but it was my job on the line. Mm -hmm. They were really tight, keeping guys outside of the business coming in. But one day, somebody had a friend that they brought in, and he was a, a butcher at a butcher shop. <laughs> and the booker booked me against him, and Eddie came to all the TVs. Uh-huh. And he was talking to me, and the kid came over to me and said, hey, I'm going to make you look really good because when I go to work tomorrow, I'm going to say, yeah, he's really a good wrestler. He turned his back and left, and Eddie said, if he doesn't come back with blood on him, you're gone. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, it was a different time and a different era. I mean, as you know, Wolfie, they were trying to keep it as close to the vest as they could Right. And like what they could do in Memphis always amazed me. They could turn a guy from heel to babyface back to babyface, but it was always the story how they got there. They just yeah. didn't do it overnight. Right. And it would make sense. In today's day and age, I can't tell you how many times guys turned, <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, it confuses me. Yeah. I see a guy at babyface one night on the. In on TV, and the next week I turn on, he, he's a heel. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> well, don't you think also that the line today is very blurred between a heel and a baby face? Yeah, I, I, I've mentioned this to, to a bunch of people. You see a match start, and the baby face throws the first punch right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, so, like you said, who's the baby face? Who's the heel? You're right. scratching your head. And I know we're into a different era, but there's still got to be a punky Morton character that draws women, that gets sympathy. Nobody sells like punky. Right. Uh, and there's no Bruiser Brody. Could you, you know how everybody does the same shit when they come to the ring, they jump on yeah. the middle rope and throw their arms in the air. Yeah. Could you imagine doing that and Brody coming in behind you? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, right. <laughs> hey, let me ask you this. Who, and you said Punky, I mean, and I've worked with him a number of times, and we actually drew a lot of money against them in, in Memphis in the mid-90s. 
who is the best, and I don't mean a technical wrestler. I mean, who's the best baby face you ever worked with? Who was just like, I love working with this dude because I know he's over and I'm on it. You know what I mean? I think, you know, I didn't get to work with Punky a lot because he was in tag team situations. Right. But he's right up there. But for me personally, it was Dusty. Yeah. Dusty knew... You know, I've heard a lot of negative things about Dusty. I wish I had read his book before he passed on. He said some wonderful things about me. Uh, He said the best two heels he ever worked with for Heat was me and Terry. Yeah. People always say, I mean, I beat Dusty on Christmas night on Lose Leave Town in a cage match with Santa at the fair and give me a gimmick. Yeah. Dusty just knew... And then when I left the territory, I did an angle to come back, and we, Dusty would re, actually quit wrestling. He was supposed to wrestle Flair until they lifted my suspension, and we did a deal with a five uh, NWA board members voted. And, of course, Eddie had the final vote. He voted for me to come back. We went to Lakeland. Dusty said he was going to get his revenge. We drew a good house. And Dusty did the job in the middle. He knew when to do the job. Right. But he also knew that his hand had to go up most of the time because he was their guy. Yeah. 90% of the time when his hand got up, whether it's me or Mark or whoever the hill was, they got the heat back and he would send the reinforcements down and you'd get them too. It was like... Davy Crockett at the Alamo, you'd be picking them off before they got there. So he'd get his hand up, and the people would still be enraged. He was very good at that. Yeah. Yeah. Legendary for sure. Um, Now, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, If I am, I apologize. How come you never worked for Vince? With all your accomplishments as a booker and a wrestler and everything, I don't think that I you've never worked for Vince, right? No, I worked for the father. And then later on, when they bought WCW, Mm -hmm. I was under an employee's contract for WCW, and they didn't buy any of those. And then then I I built the biggest gym in the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. I lived in the Keys. And I kind of got out of the wrestling business for a long time. And Mm -hmm. uh, maybe five or six years, I didn't even have the time to really watch it but then i uh sold the gym and got back into the business somewhat mm-hmm. yeah ever came up to go work for vince jr or anything like that yeah it, it, i had a meeting with stephanie and johnny laurenitis but i had just opened the gym i got you i and, got you and and the thing was originally they said you come up for tv and then you would fly you home on Tuesday. Then it went from Monday to Thursday. And then you'd have to fly back up Saturday for the TV, uh, right. you know, every every month for the pay-per-views. And yeah. I had invested a lot of money in that gym. I mean, I bought the property, knocked the building down, and had a building built. Mm. And I had and I had over $300,000 worth of equipment and at that time, a standalone gym, not meaning not a goals, not a franchise. Right. If you had bought, if you had gotten a loan on that equipment to buy the equipment, the interest rate was 30%. Mm. So I couldn't wow. do that, bought it outright, and I had a lot of money invested in it. It was one of those things, sink or swim, and I didn't think I could leave and things would go right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Go ahead, Jimmy. I'm again, a WCW guy. I, you know, grew up, like I said, mid Atlantic Jim Crockett promotions. Of course, I love the varsity club, but you know, the varsity club was a faction that really worked in my opinion. One of your factions that people kind of take the piss out of a lot is your dungeon of doom. You guys were essentially made for Hogan. Exactly. Yeah, tell me, who do you think was your favorite character in the whole time of the dungeon? Ming. Yeah, yeah. Because he gave us some believability. The whole thing about the dungeon was all of Hogan's friends. He was comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I had a long-range plan to turn him heel. 
uh, because I saw what was happening. So I had yeah. to gain comp and I let's go back and people forget this. When Hogan first came into WCW, he was about a hundred pounds lighter. Right. He looked at, and we went to so, uh, what what finally flipped me and finally got me to him to listen. We went to Chicago one night, and Gene Oakland, the great Gene Oakland, was going to interview H Hogan. And Hogan came out, and the building booed him out of the building. Yeah. And Gene said, "You can hear the somber mood tonight." Here comes Hulk Hogan. And I mm. went right to him that night, and I said, "Brother, the red and yellow is over." And he fought me for the longest time. Agents, everything. Mm -hmm. I, the night that he turned heel, I lived a mile from the Ocean Center where he turned heel. Mm -hmm. And they told I kept him at my house. He slept at my house, and I drove him when the first match went on. Wow. He built it in a limo so nobody could talk to him. Yeah. Because I was afraid of death right to the end that he would renege. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I've heard that Sting was the backup option there, or was the preliminary first option. But you know, Eric, I've heard on his podcast, I've heard some things about him. I've heard on your podcast, possibly Sting, but I don't think he would have really worked in the same way that Hogan did, right? No, because it was it was the invasion of Paul and Nash from New York, right? And what was who was the standard bearer for the WWF at the time? Hulk. It couldn't right. have worked. Sting was right. a WCW guy. It had to be Hogan. It might have been a contingency plan, but in my head, I was going to drag Hulk out there if I had him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he kind of looked like a basketball player at that time almost. He had yeah. lost so much weight, you know. And people forget that. And, and the other thing is, remember the finger point of doom that Kevin Nash was taking so much heat over? Right. Yes, right. he's a good soldier. Yeah. I want people to go pull that up and look at the size difference between Hogan and Kevin. Yeah. You know, uh, Hogan, you know, he was, he was uh, people say manipulated or whatever. The, and if you've been around them all, we're all manipulators in some respects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but he was the standard bearer for a long time. And he had creative control. So do you think he wanted to have a match with Nash? I don't think so. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes total sense. <laughs> One more question that I have before I want to go into a section that we call the name game yep. is Brian Pillman and the Booker Man deal. I know our timelines are a little off here, but tell me a little bit about that. Did that come as a, just a total surprise to you when that happened? Brian came to me with the idea. Okay. And, you know, besides losing a great talent, we lost a great mind. Right. Uh, Brian worked with guys like nobody had ever worked them before. He would call me at night and he, uh, he'd say, what's going on? And I'd say, well, what's going on with you? And he'd say, guys come up to me and say, I hope you kick his ass to this match. I said, it's funny. Same guys that said that to you said it to me, too. <laughs> we didn't smarten the iron up to that. We didn't smarten the referee up to the book of match match. And Brian was just on a different plane. And all of a sudden, Hogan wanted to work with him because he had heat. Uh, it was all his. I would listen to what he wanted to do. Maybe I'd throw an idea in. It was all Brian. Tell you a story. Mark Madden mentioned it with this podcast with Flair just recently mm -hmm. that he wanted to get on the sidelines and want to use Mark Madden's pass for the Super Bowl because Mark's a legitimate sports writer. Right. And okay. What he, what, he, what he wanted to do during the Super Bowl, he wanted to run down to the goal post, chain himself, and put a bunch of locks on. Wow. <laughs> That was the national publicity. He said they put him away for 90 days, maybe, but he's yeah. willing to do that. He, he just thought out of the box. The other thing, I'm sure the gun is with him and Austin. People still right. talk about that. Right? Yeah. I mean, he, he pushed the boundaries so, 
so far that you thought, well, you mentioned it earlier about believing in something. Yeah. Yeah. You knew he had to be nuts. You knew. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. You know, once again, we're with Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with the name game. Let's take a quick time out and get a word from one of my dope ass sponsors. And we'll be right back with more Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Hey folks, this is Wolfie D here. And if you are looking to buy or sell a home in Tennessee or Southern Kentucky, you're gonna wanna call my buddy, the rock star realtor, Benji Bowie. And you say, Wolfie, how do I get in touch with this rock star? Well, you can call him directly at 615-390-8216. You can go to his website, BowieHomes.com. That's B-U-I-E Homes.com. Or you can email him at BenBowie34 at gmail.com. When you need a home, you need the Rockstar Realtor. Benji is a member of Exit Realty's Garden Gate team in Gallatin, Tennessee. All right, we're back with the Taskmaster Kevin Sullivan, and today we are playing the name game. Now it's time to play the name game. Now, this is a simple game, Kevin. All it is is just a quick one or two word answer about some names that I bring up just to maybe just to get your thoughts and opinions on some of these guys here. The first one I want to bring up is the name Austin Idol. He he could have been a huge international star through nothing but money. You know, the Swoofy in yeah. Memphis, Continental, Atlanta. I had a big feud with him and then. We became partners against the Freebirds, the famous four flat tires. He was great. Yeah. He was great. How about Steve Kern? Steve, I don't think he got his due when he went to WWE. Uh, he drew money everywhere he went. Yeah. Him and Stan, uh, great performer. Yeah. Okay, this one we don't talk enough about, but a huge part of Memphis and a huge part of your career as well. The Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. He's up in the top five managers of all time, and that's saying something. Yeah. I and mean, he was great. And the next guy, of course, Jerry the King Lawler. He's still wrestling. Yep. <laughs> I was just his partner Saturday night. I ain't wrestled in like six years, and they asked me to come do this show where me and him were partners. And uh, he he got around better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't uh, put the stake through his heart yet. He's a vampire. He gets yeah. younger and younger. I know it. That's amazing. Yeah. Another guy, you know, had a good run with there was Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Very smart guy. Very smart guy. Uh, rest in peace, Eddie. I mean, he he drew money everywhere he went. Fabulous yeah. performer. Yeah. And a very smart guy. And, you know, I think it's funny. I think he wanted to be Jerry Lawler. Yeah. You know, carry the crowd. Always the whole thing. He copied him. Copied them. Yeah. Good person to copy, too. Oh, for sure. Okay, well, here's another little run here. I know we talked about Dusty Berry. I'm going to mark them off the list here, but how about Black Jack Mulligan? Without Black Jack Mulligan, there wouldn't have been me. Uh, when I turned heel after Barry, I was booked the Sunday against Black Jack. And Black Jack and I, you know, back then, separate dress rooms, but there was a big curtain. So, Blackjack came over to, had me come over to the baby face side, and he said, Dusty, what do you want? And Dusty said, let's work a DQ. And Blackjack said, no, he's going to beat me, Dusty. Then I'm going to send Barry down, and he's going to kill Barry. Then I'm going to send Kendall down. He's going to kill Kendall. And he said, and you, you're coming down to save me, and he's going to leave you laying too. If we're going to get him over, we'll get them over. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, I can't have someone on here and not bring up Wolfie and my personal favorite tag team of all time, the Road Warriors. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, the first time I had a, we had to wrestle the Warriors, me and Mark, 
They had brought him into Florida. Florida was in disarray and he had just died. And they said, we need to draw a hundred thousand dollars this week. And we did an angle with blackjack where he broke a bottle and stuck in his face. So he was out and they brought in the war. He brought in the warriors. First time in building, the people had seen them on national TV. They got what has been now known as that Road Warrior Pop as soon as they came in. We mm -hmm. did a deal where Blackjack pulled me aside and said, you're not going to put these guys over, are you? And I was booking at the time. I said, why? He said, because you're with me next week. I said, okay. So I see him with his head out watching the sh matches. And we go into a double DQ, and he's got a big smile on his face and walks off. Mark figured, no worries, probably eat us up, but Mulligan would beat both of us up a lot worse. And they were great to work with. And Mike was a dear friend of mine, and Joe was too. Yeah, they were yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. How about primetime Brian Lee? I don't know why Brian didn't go further in the business. He had the personality for it. He, uh, I don't know... Well, do you think him going up and being that fake undertaker hurt his push? I agree. That, I yeah. agree sometimes, 100%. Yeah, sometimes you can't make that big mistake. And I think after that, it hurt his. And he was great. See, I won't go to for about, about four years. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got a couple more here. I'll be done with this section of the show here. The next one I have is, I want to just ask you, one of my favorite all-time characters was the Earthquake, but of course you knew him as Avalanche, John Tenta. Great guy. Great human being. And tough as nails, you know that. Yeah. Uh, his character was great. He was perfect for the WWF. And that's why Hogan brought him and we put him in the Dungeon of Doom. Hogan was really high on him. And then you guys almost got sued because of Avalanche, and then you changed him right. to the shark, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. There were a lot, a lot, at that time, there were a lot of lawsuits going back and forth. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I've got one last one. This is Wolfie's number one guy here. He's one of the greats, for sure. Randy Macho Man Savage. Randy and I knew each other. We were in bodybuilding contests together. Randy was one of the greatest performers of all times. I mean, he drew money everywhere he went. Uh, unfortunately, it was like every time that he was going to get the push, Hogan would reappear mm. and would crave control. But Randy is, to me, uh, the top two money drawers of all times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a character, too, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much for participating in the name game, Taskmaster Kevin Sullivan. We'll be right back with Current Affairs. DJ, hit the music. It's a current affair. All right, we're back with Current Affairs, sponsored by Coach's Corner Sports Grill. And today we're with the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, one of the greatest villains in the history of wrestling. My first question right now, who are some of the characters or just wrestlers that you really enjoy watching? I know you said MJF, but are there any others that really? Yeah, uh, uh, Roman Reigns. Oh, Roman yeah. Reigns. Uh, I, uh, if pe people like watching them, they better get their fill of them now because that kid's destined to Hollywood. That's I mean, well, uh, yeah. Don't you think, Wolfie? He, he's going to yeah, be the point. next Rock. Yeah. You know, when, in a few years, when The Rock gets a little older and he goes into more production, Roman yeah. will be quite with The Rock Rolls. Wow. Yeah, that's a good call. We'll call you back when that happens, Kevin. <laughs> that's going <laughs> to Let me ask you something cuz the other night, you know, at Royal Rumble, did you watch Royal Rumble, Kevin? I saw I I didn't watch it, but I saw it on YouTube. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, one thing that I noticed in his match is that he and Seth, you know, they're two technical heels at that time. Their characters are, are the heel. You know, Seth was the more classic heel where Roman is kind of the tweener. You either love him or you hate him, and it's kind of good for the way that his character was going. I noticed in the way that he would sell that he was letting Seth be the true heel. I, I don't know, you know, where you maybe didn't watch it, but the way that... I, I did, uh, and I agree with you 100%. I just noticed certain subtle ways that he would sell that would take it a little more to what you would almost call a babyface type sell versus, you know, the chicken shit heel kind of thing, you know? Right. And I think, as you know, Wolfie, it's hard to have a heel versus heel match with the people oh. excited for both people. Yeah. But someone's going to be the baby face. And I thought he did a hell of a job because he hasn't been a baby face in a long time. And he did it suddenly, too. Like you said, suddenly really thought was cool. Yeah. Well, you know, my next question is this. So, you know, you've heard the term forbidden door. Obviously, right. everybody's heard it a million times. How would you, Kevin Sullivan, let's say you had the book and you could do literally whatever you want. So essentially, let's say you are running the WWE, essentially, because everyone would work with the WWE. You know, what would you do if you had that and you were allowed to just open that forbidden door? What would you do specifically? That's a tough question because once you open that door, how do you shut it? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And once you open that door, if somebody gets over that you are not under contract with, you're in a tough situation. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Uh, uh, they they look at everything as they're on the stock market and they have to sell so much stocks a year. That mm -hmm. I think that's why they've been cutting so many guys that they're trying to raise their stocks and showing how profitable they are. I think that if you open the door, we'll say if you let Daniel Bryan back in, who I think is spectacular. Yeah. Okay. Now he gets over and he would, the people would blow. He would overshadow the guys on the card. Then he goes home to AEW. What do you do then? Right. What do you do? Yeah. You would have for to pay him. Real, yeah. For them, it's a real complicated question. Yeah. Hey, here's, I got a current affair that just speaking of that made me think of it. Just being in the business so long, you know how we get jaded and we don't trust things. We think everything's working. Right. What are your thoughts on the Vince Shane McMahon deal? Uh, to me, I could see, and this is our paranoid wrestling yeah. <laughs> mind work. Mm -hmm. I could see Shane coming in with a different faction. Okay. It'd be the perfect, perfect way to go. Do I think a father is going to fire his son? Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and essentially almost the heir to the throne, you know? It, it, right, it exactly. Sense. Exactly, especially now that Triple H has gotten sick. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, you know, Wolfie and I have talked about this one before on current affairs and Wolfie's actually got a pretty interesting theory that he could theoretically see Shane showing up on AEW just to be similar to that last WCW episode where it was the simulcast. And that was one of his theories. You know, he's got a million, but, <laughs> but it's a good theory. It's a good yeah. theory. But again, if he is in fight, boy, you're opening a door that. Spiral yeah. the wrong idea. Right, right. So you did kind of lead me in a direction there, Kevin, earlier, and we're almost through for the day here. But you brought up basically raising their stocks by letting their people go and, and things like that. I did recently see that in Indonesia, the WWE network is now on Disney Plus. Now I know in America it's on Peacock and you know it's a little bit of a more fluid thing now rather than its own app. Do you see that opening a door for a possible purchased by someone like a Disney or an NBC? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, nothing lasts forever. I live on the beach here of the island, and there's a Buddhist colony, and they come down on the beach and paint these wonderful sculptures with all these different colored rocks. After they finish, and people come and look, and of course, they're going to get a donation. After they finish, they destroy it. And it's nothing lasts forever. So right. they've had a hell of a run. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
that's a crazy thought that WWE wouldn't be there, but you know, or in its current state, at least, you know, right. Um, right. right. <laughs> now, we'll go back to this. When you first started in Memphis, did you ever think territories were going to go away? Well, see, when I started, it was like I was I was 15 in 1989. I got to yeah. Memphis, got my first job uh, there in 93. It was okay. by that time, it was pretty much the only one left already at that point. <laughs> so, and business was down in 93. And uh, we actually left for a little while. Came back. Randy Hales had the book. And he pushed us to the moon against uh, rock and roll and the Smoky Mountain feud and all that stuff. And we right. the, you know, and brought the houses all back up. And then after that shit was over, um, you know, we we got a job with, with New York. Then we got a little small run there in WCW. We went to ECW. So when we left, it just, Jerry Jarrett sold his half to, um, uh, what was that guy's name? Larry Burton. I don't know if you remember that whole deal. But when that guy came in, it was Lawler and him running it. And it went to shit and they shut it down. Yeah. Well, when I broke into the business, there was 37 territories. Yeah. So I would have given anything to have worked in those days. Yeah. yeah. When I broke into the business, I never thought it would go away like it did. But yeah. Andy Graham, the brilliant he was, I remember one time, I was very close to Eddie. Uh, I'd go fish with Eddie a bunch. When him and Michael were on the outs, I'd become the surrogate son. Uh, when WTBS started to get a foothold, he said, this is the end of the territorial system. And he was damn right. He, he could almost tell the future, couldn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. You could tell him that you had seen everything. Smart guy. Yeah, I've heard he that. He went to the seventh grade. He, he was a pilot. He was a, for planes. He was a pilot for big ships. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of another brilliant guy, we've had the taskmaster Kevin Sullivan on today. Kevin, one thing I do want to promote, you know, our good buddy Nick from Captain's Corner on Facebook, the good captain. He is actually the one that connected us together in a kind of a cross promotion of our podcast and his Facebook show. You know, tell him a little bit about I know you're going to be on there March 6th at 6 p.m. That's Sunday, March 6th at 6 p.m. on the Captain's Corner Facebook page. And the actual event is in the description of this show right now. Tell them a little bit about the show coming up, Kevin. What are you going to be doing well, there? Well, I'm going to be there and signing autographs and uh, doing whatever he wants me to do. I really enjoy talking just like I do with talking to you guys. I love talking about wrestling. Yeah, that's our favorite part of the day, isn't it, Wolfie? <laughs> yeah, buddy. So I do see you, you know, all over the place. I'm an actual big fan of Hannibal TV. I see that you are involved with his show a lot or his channel. And, you know, one of my favorite wrestling podcasts of all time was with you and MSL. What else are you doing right now? Well, um, uh, Andrew Anderson, uh, he's become the uh, new Purple Haze. And I'm I'm taking him around to Texas, the East Coast, Florida. We're doing quite a bit, so that's awesome. I've been staying busy. Yeah, yeah. Be cool. Is there a social media that they can find you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, so they can find yeah. me there. Yeah, well, that'll be in the show notes as well. You know, Kevin, I can't say enough. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know I speak for Wolfie. You know, you definitely are a legend that we wanted to talk to. Wolfie, why don't you take us out here? Yeah, I'm going to take us out. I'm going to give a quick plug, Pro Wrestling Tees. Go to the Live and In Color store, and we've, I've got a bunch of different T-shirts on there for anybody that wants one. Kevin, do you have a Pro Wrestling Tees store? Yeah, yeah I got them on there, too. So, okay, so if you yeah. want a Kevin Sullivan shirt or a Live and in Color with Wolfie D shirt uh, or a PG-13 shirt, go check that out. And again, like Jimmy said, thank you so much for coming on, Kevin. It's been great talking to you. What a great interview. And and again, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You're listening to Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, so much, sir. Thank you. Thank Have you, Kevin. A, come back and see us, okay? Yeah, All right. please. I enjoyed it very okay. much, guys. And now a word from our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. 
the podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Chic Jared are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this team does it all. And all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Are you a pro wrestling fan? Well, stop by Captain's Corner, where you can get autographed photos, cards, magazines, and figures from all of your favorite wrestling superstars of the past, present, and future. You'll also be able to participate in live signings in the weeks and months to come. Make sure to stop by Captain's Corner on Facebook and give us a holler. Remember, cheers to the working man. That's right, it's the talk of Middle Tennessee, the channel you love to hate and the channel you hate to love. It's Brian Turner from Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. And if you're looking for matches from Wolfie D to Jerry Lawler to Dusty Rhodes and the team that put a pimp before your eyes and a goatee between your thighs, Booty Call and Athena, go to LostWrestling.com. See, I made it easy for you. Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. Booyah! Join me, Gene Jackson, for the Jackson Interaction Podcast, where I'll be doing one-on-one interviews with people from the world of professional wrestling, as well as stand-up comedy. You can get them anywhere podcasts are available in both video and audio form, but you can find them all at GeneJacksonPod.com. So that was another great episode. Hey, Wolfie, tell them where they can find you on social media. Jimmy, they can find me in the club, bottle full of bub. I'm just kidding. Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal page is Warren Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. I'm on Instagram, at Warren Wolf 13. You can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, at Live Wolfie D. Here's the thing. Wolfie always has offers for his autographed photos. He has a selection of some awesome photos from throughout his career that he will autograph and personalize any way that you want him to. Just contact him either directly at his personal Facebook page or through any one of our other pages, and we'll make sure you get in contact directly with Wolfie. Get those photos, right, Wolfie? Yeah, I've got some good stuff on there, you know, to help with the podcast. Folks, if you can't get out to a show to meet Wolfie D, there's nothing like that, especially for the fans of PG-13 and Wolfie D. And before we go, you can always find me, your host, Jimmy Street, at James Rock Street on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And hey, Jimmy, before we go real quick, I just want to add in there, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate First of all, the work you've done for this podcast. You have worked your butt off. Secondly, the people that are liking the page. Beyond that, even more, is the people that are listening. And we really appreciate that. Yeah, and remember, guys, the podcast drops a new episode every Monday at noon. And our past episodes are streaming now on demand on all major podcast formats. Thanks again. I got a cap for you don't. He got a cap for you don't. I got a cap for you don't. He got a cap for you don't. He got a cap for you don't. He got a cap for you don't. And here we go. The original white boy that came out sagging, not bragging, don't be hating, cause I'm spitting the truth. Still loving it in color. Don't rush your mother. Utilize a hubcap. I like any other. Back in the day, I was NOD. And I was P to the G plus the one and the three. In case you forgot, they call me Wolfie D. Been cloned and copied so many times. Tied us up as taking credit for what is mine. You know who you are without me name dropping wrestling's first white boy coming out hip hop. Been doing it like this since 92. Lay low for a while when you thought I was through. Listen real close to these rhymes that I've injected. This shit's so sick it makes your ears get infected. Mad skills, no faking, there is no one great. Cause I'm bringing more folks and over one for data. Not here to play games, so you better be aware. You don't like me, so what? I really don't care. All the time I keep ticking and I can't be stopped. You set a step to the side unless you want to get dropped. When my finish, I'll straight knock you out. Please allow me to tell you what it's all about. Gonna wind it up. And I'm driving it home, it's Wolfie D, baby Huh, I got a cap for your dome I got a cap for your dome We got a cap for your dome We got a cap for your dome This has been a James Rock Street production